1979, the Florida Legislature created the Art and State Buildings Program. Since its inception, over 900 artworks have been purchased or commissioned for the permanent collection of the state of Florida. The stewardship and management of this collection rests in the hands of hundreds of individuals. Like any other important endeavor, there is a need to consider and refine the means by which we go about creating and sustaining this collection. While no one documentary can be definitive in providing answers to all of the questions that will arise in developing a public art collection, it's our hope that this documentary will provide a point of departure for the ongoing discussion of how one best creates a public art treasure for the state of Florida. This documentary is designed to provide you with an overview of the process, strategies, and the range of project possibilities inherent in the Florida Art and State Buildings Program. We will discuss developing a project program, selecting an artist, building a budget, managing a project, documenting the finished project, and conserving Florida's collection of public art. I don't know what you thought this workshop would be, but not only will we be making art, we will be making history. We're going to be designing, painting. It will be installed permanently in the new education building at the University of South Florida. The process begins by defining the desires of the selection committee. This definition is called the project program. A program is a written description of a committee's expectations for a given project. It's a tool that the committee uses in defining the sort of artist they want. In turn, it's a tool that the artist uses, almost a rudder, if you will, for the overall project. The artist uses it to develop his concepts. Uh, essentially, it provides the context for a project. Does the committee want the project to occur inside of a building, or is it an exterior project? Do they want to develop a plaza site, or is it more of a fountain? Is it a monument that's to be set in the environment? Generally, the committee decides if they want some kind of reference to what is going on in a structure, they eventually decide, with the assistance of the artist, not to be, say, too literal about that, because there are um, educational boards that can explain what goes on in a building. More usually you will find that the artist and the committee decide to have an artwork that is a reference to and elaborate in a more symbolic way what the function of the particular building might be. With a good program, which needn't be, by the way, more than a couple sentences and shouldn't be longer than a paragraph, but with that good program, the committee is a long way in the direction of selecting the artist, and the artist, once selected, uh, is moving in the right direction for the project. Once the committee has developed a program, the job of selecting an artist who can fulfill the program's charge is the next challenge. Whether an artist has completed many projects or is undertaking his or her first efforts in the sphere of public art, a body of work previously completed is the best means of predicting an artist's ability to meet the program outlined for the project. I think that's a question in the beginning with an artist who's, who is out there for the first time and it's a big responsibility to give somebody public you know, monies and, 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 and you sort of hope they're going to come through. Well, if we think of the program as a rudder for a project, certainly the artist is the engine. It's a key component, or he, she is a key component uh, that will determine the project's success. The first key element in selecting an artist is at what point in the process do you select that artist. Ideally, you begin that selection process as soon as possible when the program committee for the facility is gathering to decide what kind of facility they want is the ideal point. This is actually called the program stage. Once the timing has been decided, and sometimes it won't happen in that program stage, sometimes the facility will already be done, you have a better feel for time frame at that point in time and can consider what the options are for the committee depending on that time frame. I think that probably everyone would want to have um, an artist brought in as soon as possible, uh, if it's possible. But I think there, there are um, good, good possibilities in either in either case. I mean, sometimes when an artist is brought in and the project has been finished, um, there are issues that can be solved and, and, and the artist's work fits in and so it was part of the, the original concept. The potential, if, if there's a collaboration between artist and architect and landscaper and client, 
if uh, the potential is great that the art really goes beyond an image or an object and it goes into the entire um, feel and tone of the space. The, the second key element is certainly how well informed that selection committee is. Your art experts that are on the committee serve a pivotal role at this point in time. It's their job to explain the range of possibilities available to the committee, to do research about the artist who uh, can work within the budget and the time frame that you're given, and can also focus on, again, the program that that selection committee has already developed. The biggest problem with committees is the committees come with an artist very often that in their mind represents public art. And it may have nothing to do with the site. It may not even be a good artist because the committee person might not have been be aware or educated or know or even begin to know. They know an artist and they want their artist to somehow have something to do with this. You know, I think uh, as a case study, uh, Nancy Holt's selection for Solar Rotary is a pretty good example of how a committee successfully completes its task of selecting an artist. Solar Rotary was, I, I, I should think it would have been a difficult site uh, to articulate. There was a sloping circular plaza. There was a lot of, uh, of uh, people having to go through it. And so how do you uh, make a large piece of sculpture and not, that's not a Richard Serra and still allow for, the, uh, for this kind of passage uh, situation of people? Uh, I think that her articulation of, of the problems of the piece or the intent of the piece uh, was very successful in that the statement was more or less linear, uh, curvilinear to be exact. Uh, she got everything kind of up off the ground, uh, allowing for pedestrian crossing and all. And, and I, think this, I think the scope of the piece is particularly ambitious. The idea of uh, the solstice, the summer solstice lining up, the commemorative plates of the history of Florida. Uh, also aligning with the sun kind of situation. It's almost as if Nancy is using the media, of the, uh, using the sun as a media for her own work, which is uh, a, a, a kind of poetry that uh, also involves a broad scope of imagination. And I like the idea of the meteor on the bench. I like the fact that the bench is constructed of sands from all the cardinal points of the university and all. I mean, she really thoughtfully pulled in every aspect, every potential aspect of interest into the work and concentrated it very successfully. Nancy knew what she wanted to do, and uh, experientially she has a, a lot of uh, projects behind her at this point. Uh, and she has the, the modesty to be able to call upon uh, local resources, and uh, she knows that she has to draw upon other people, which is, which is natural. Her ego doesn't get involved with the creative process at all. Final aspect of uh, the selection of an artist is uh, reviewing those finalists. There's two different approaches that can be taken. If you're dealing with an artist that's less experienced, the committee may choose to have them do a proposal. Here, a group of artists, typically three, are given the program and asked to develop a full-scale proposal, drawings, models, photographs, whatever that artist can do to communicate the ideas that they would take and, and approach the project with. That works with younger artists who haven't had as much experience, but it has a, a real drawback. You're essentially asking the artist to do the key work for the project within extremely limited constraints of both time and budget. But with an artist who's prove themselves in, in that sense. I think asking them to do a proposal, like you say, is, is really out of line. Because the most creative part of the project and the most uh, intense part of the project is the period of time when you're thinking about what you're going to do and how you're going to respond to the site and everything else. A preferable situation is to have the artist come in and make a presentation of their previous work. If the artist has done a fair amount of public artwork, the committee will gain a great deal by looking at the sort of vision an artist brings to the project, the kind of vocabulary. They also get a real sense in this presentation of who that artist is, what sort of attitude, what, what, what kind of focus do they have on a given project, and how do they deal with the various committee members. In a way, it's a matter sometimes of personalities. You might have two artists that are equally capable of completing a project, but the committee has a greater sense of uh, comfort with one of those artists. And so that review process, I think, is the third critical element.
Project budgets for the Art and State Buildings program are based on one half of 1% of the construction budget. There are, however, various means by which a committee can expand this budget. Vincent O'Hearn discusses strategies for expanding a budget. Well, each project is uh, a unique entity, if you will, and so uh, there's a variety of approaches that can be taken. It just simply depends on, on what's available by way of opportunity to the committee uh, in a given project. Take the case of solar rotary. Uh, here we had a situation where we needed certain professional skills. Um, the plaques in the ground plane, the central seat of the, of the piece, all have uh, events that occur in relationship to the sunlight. And so we needed to know precisely when those things would occur. In order to do that, it required 100 hours of trigonometry calculations for each and every plaque and for the central seat. We turned to one of our own great resources here at the university, that is our intellectual resources, and asked Professor Emeritus, Dr. Jack Robinson, to do those calculations for us. Jack did, volunteering his time, and so providing a tremendous in-kind contribution. Had we had to pay for those calculations, it would have cost us over $20,000. So in-kind donations, the, the resources that you may have available to you, is the first key means by which a project can be expanded. A second means is to look to the community, to look to an individual or a corporation who may have a particular interest in the project and may be able to contribute significantly to the project budget. In the case of Solar Rotary, we look to the Tampa Tribune. Now, as it happens, the Tampa Tribune was celebrating their 100th year anniversary at the time that Solar Rotary was build, being built. A second key factor is that many of the employees at the Tampa Tribune got their training right here in the Department of Communications. Uh, and so, combining those two factors, we made an approach to the Tribune. They agreed to expand the budget by more than 50 percent. Because of this, we in turn could give them, I think, something that's uh, really wonderful for an individual or corporation. That is a naming opportunity. The site where Solar Rotary is located is called the Tampa Tribune Plaza. Uh, and so, this means of going to the community to look for support, obviously, a second critical means. The third way that a budget can be expanded is through the use of construction funds, furniture and equipment funds, landscape funds. Uh, in many cases, the project is being built in conjunction with the development of the facility. Oftentimes, monies that are set aside for lighting, for paving, for some, kind, some part of the interior design can be utilized in the artwork, and that's another good way that the budget can be expanded. The money was going to be spent anyway. You might as well choose lights that the artist can use or paving that works for the artwork. To summarize, I think the committee, once they have developed a program and selected the artist, need to take a very careful look at what their circumstances are. What time in the project are they involved in? What community interests might exist in the project? Is it possible? for the artist to fulfill some of the requirements of the construction. A selection process that results in the acquisition of an artist's work is a relatively simple project to manage. On the other extreme, a site-specific project integrated into the overall design of a building, which includes both private funds, furniture, and equipment monies, and construction dollars, presents an infinitely more complex management requirement. The role of the public art administrator could best be defined as facilitator. This individual brings together the various parties, artists, architect, occupant, subcontractor, benefactor, and coordinates their effort for the fulfillment of a project. Aside from the paperwork and the minor administrative details, they really function as a coach or perhaps an orchestra leader, conductor, in that their function is to support and nurture this whole process, this whole collaboration between the committee members and the artist to finally come up with such a, a unique vision for a particular project. And yet, just like a coach or a conductor, they're not just concerned with one game or one performance. It's their responsibility to consider not just the current project, but to consider how the future projects and may all string together to make a total vision for a particular program. This individual, whether full-time staff, student, or volunteer, is responsible for filing reports, 
organizing meetings, finding solutions, or coordinating resolutions to problems which arise during the construction process. In an integrated project where there are multiple sources of funding, this process may require that the project coordinator maintain contact and communication between several dozen people, each with their own needs and agendas. Elements of leadership and diplomacy, coupled with an overall grasp of the artist, architect, and occupant's intent, are essential elements in performing this duty. Since experience is the best teacher, a preferred circumstance is that the public art coordinator be a permanent staff member of the institute or agency for which the project is being completed. The preferred background for this individual would include a thorough training in art history or studio art, a working understanding of architectural and engineering terms, and some familiarity with construction techniques, fundraising, and grant writing. A strong foundation in speaking and written communication is essential. While one recognizes that ideals are not always attainable, the attributes mentioned in this description should be sought out for the individual charged with managing a project. Vincent Ahern discusses the wide range of managerial styles a public art administrator may be called upon to adopt. You know, I, in a strange way, I think a public art uh, administrator needs to be a good dancer. Uh, and by that, I mean simply that they need to respond uh, to what they find. I found that the process can either destroy or make the project at the beginning. In a funny way, finding the artist is the least of it. So I have made project management a very important part of my business. In the public world, you have to, it's a big education process. You have to um, talk to a lot of people uh, who don't necessarily think in those terms of art and, and, and images. Um, so you sell your idea, you, and, but really, you, you know, the creative process of making this is maybe is maybe 10 to 20 percent of the, of the project time. And then the rest of the time is really uh, is, is making it and, and, and administrating. An enormous part of public art is, is, is in the administration and facilitating, much more like an architect. Different artists bring very different qualities to a project. Uh, some artists are perfectly fine, sort of on their own. They need very little logistical support or managerial support. Uh, others need a great deal of that kind of, uh, of effort. Uh, a younger artist may not know how to write specifications for a project, for subcontractors. They may not even know how to find a subcontractor, and so uh, the public art administrator will fulfill that role for them or help them fulfill that role. Uh, still other artists have asked that uh, the public art administrative function as a general contractor, managing the site for them. Uh, another artist may be dealing with a myriad of subcontractors, 30, 40, 50 different subcontractors, and need the public art administrator to play the role of uh, a contact point between that artist and the various people that they're dealing with. I think first, first of all, they should be knowledgeable and choose the right artist with the right situation. And I'm afraid uh, also understand the artist. It's like a, a good film director really has to understand the actor to know what he can get out of that actor. And so one needs to be a pretty good listener, uh, figuring out what it is that a particular project requires uh, and fulfill that role. So a good listener, a good job of analyzing what the artist is bringing, what the committee wants, what the needs of the project are, uh, come together in determining the role of uh, a public art administrator in managing a project. A finished project should be documented in a variety of ways. Vincent Ahern discusses the rationale and methods for project documentation. Well, projects are documented in a number of different ways. Uh, certainly, they're documented uh, through photographic means, oftentimes through videotape, but they also need to be documented in a written fashion. Uh, documentation is often the first means by which uh, people come to be acquainted with the project. For projects over $10,000, we require photographic documentation of uh, publication quality. Uh, and the reason for this is that many of the projects completed in the state are reviewed, not only uh, locally, but even nationally. Projects done at USF have been reviewed in Art in America, Sculpture Magazine, um, Chronicle of Higher Education, even in the uh, U.S. Information uh, Agency and sent out abroad. So this photographic documentation uh, is a critical means by which we reach an audience. The second uh, thought about documentation is that 
it isn't just about promoting a project, it's also about educating people. On a regular basis, we deal with students in the Hillsborough County area, K through 12, 60, 100 at a time, often in an auditorium situation, showing slides of projects that we've completed. This in turn leads to trips to campus where they actually come to see the project. So that documentation for educational purposes, both in the K through 12 level, as well as at the university level, uh, is critically important. The third factor to keep in mind is that these projects are being completed and will exist for decades to come. And so photographic documentation of a completed project is a means by which archivists or conservationists can come back and restore a project in years to come. It's also a means by which a person 10, 20, 30 years from now can study the process by which a project was built. Uh, so again, photographic docu documentation, very, very important. I also meant, uh, mentioned written documentation. Upon a project's completion, it's very important to get the facts together. What materials were the project, was the project built with? Uh, what was the means of construction? What was the process of construction? Uh, who were the participants? Uh, the art administrator, the architect, the key subcontractors who played pivotal roles in a project's development. These people not only should be credited, but they also become resources for researching the history of a project, should that be necessary in a 5, 10, or 15 year period where the artist may not uh, any longer be available uh, to, to provide that sort of information. Uh, so that written documentation, I think, is also key to the full understanding uh, and completion of a, of a project. Conservation begins with the selection of a site for the artwork. While Florida's climate is moderate in terms of extremes of cold, humidity and intense heat pose an ongoing threat to the conservation of artworks, regardless of the material from which they are created. Intense sunlight causes color to fade, while humidity encourages the growth of organic materials that destroy many materials and patina others in an unsuitable fashion. There's a lot of resources for the artist to consult in terms of what makes a piece of artwork last and what kinds of things that the artist should be concerned with to make sure that their artwork, their artwork, lasts for an awful long time. It's part of our procedure that the artist must provide a, a maintenance um, memo, you might say, a description of the artwork's materials and what kinds of things need to be done on what schedule to maintain it. The committee is very responsible for making sure that the artwork that is finally produced has a longevity. And they are generally very serious about taking that responsibility to the level of investigating the materials of a particular artwork. What is it going to be like five years from now, 10 years from now? Will it rust? Is it meant to rust? Will it fade? Uh, will the paint chip? And that, those are all very important considerations. And these works are collected not just for us, not just for today, not just for the dedication ceremony. Florida's permanent art collection is for the future. It's for our children and grandchildren. And in order for these artworks to really speak to them, to be around to speak to them, it's very important that they be conserved and maintained appropriately for the future. Conservation can be as simple as using security hangers and sighting a painting with northern exposure to avoid direct contact with the sun or as complex as the daily maintenance required for some fountains. For larger, more complex projects, an artist's agreement that includes a design development phase affords experts such as architects and engineers the opportunity to troubleshoot problems before they occur. For instance, in a circumstance where paint is called for, one should use a readily available paint. This paint should be suitable for exposures and environments common to the area. These two simple conservation decisions may extend the life of a given work for years, if not decades. Such a solution is far easier to provide before a project is completed than it is to retrofit in order to correct an existing problem. Any project sited in a public environment is subject to vandalism. But siting a project in a highly trafficked area, as opposed to a remote site, often prevents vandalism simply because there are many people to observe and report such activity. 
Regardless of how carefully a project is designed and sited, regular maintenance of the finished work is required. The Art and State Buildings Guide requires that a condition report is filed for each and every project within the state's collection every three years. A careful analysis of the condition of a work of art is the first step in the maintenance process. With this in hand, the responsible agency can refer to the artist maintenance manual required for each completed project and take the steps outlined to remedy the problem. In extreme situations where the artwork has deteriorated beyond the scope anticipated in the maintenance manual, the artist should be contacted for consultation on the project's restoration. In situations where the artist is deceased or the solution is beyond the artist's technical means, a professional conservator specializing in the particular materials utilized in the project's construction should be consulted to restore the artwork to its original condition, budget permitting. In the end, the cultural heritage represented by the collection of Florida's art and state buildings projects can only survive through the ongoing diligence of its trustees, those user agency representatives whose job responsibilities include the care of Florida's cultural treasure. It's not unusual for a public art project to take several years to complete. In many instances, a work of art is dedicated four to five years after the first selection committee meeting. It is, therefore, sometimes shocking when the public finds the finished work controversial. One should bear in mind that the best projects are provocative. In fact, indifference on the part of the public could be looked upon as defeat. Over time, a work of art may come to celebrate a vision of a particular age. But at its birth, the discussion of its merit and meaning should be embraced as a barometer of its life force. Disagreement, debate, and even disdain are all common to the human condition and deserve their moment on the stage along with acclaim, acceptance, and celebration in the theater of public art. Thank you.